shock. Jesus reveals why Iran attacked Israel. The end times is coming. As conflict in the Middle East intensified and natural disasters struck, some voices are taking the opportunity to offer biblical interpretations. Religious teachers and authors, especially some conservative Christians, often draw on these kinds of current events as examples of how various predictions and descriptions in the Old and New Testaments could be coming true. Many of these religious leaders view actions in Iran, a Muslim-majority country, as playing a special role in these predictions, which usually focus on the apocalypse or the end of days. Recently, Iran made a move to attack Israel, shocking the whole world. Why is that? Because believers believe that what God prophesied is gradually coming to pass. That is also the reason why this war broke out. So is it fulfillment of prophecy? And what is going to happen after this terrifying event? Let's dive deeper into today's video to explore what God says and what is happening in Israel. In Matthew 24, 5 and 8, Jesus gives us some important clues for discerning the approach of the end times. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. An increase in false messiahs, an increase in warfare, and increases in famines, plagues, and natural disasters, these are signs of the end times. In this passage, though, we are given a warning. We are not to be deceived because these events are only the beginning of birth pains. The end is still to come. Some interpreters point to every earthquake, every political upheaval, and every attack on Israel as a sure sign that the end times are rapidly approaching. While the events may signal the approach of the last days, they are not necessarily indicators that the end times have arrived. The Apostle Paul warned that the last days would bring a marked increase in false teaching. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. The last days are described as perilous times because of the increasingly evil character of man and people who actively oppose the truth. Other possible signs of the end times would include the rebuilding of a Jewish temple in Jerusalem, increased hostility toward Israel, and advances toward a one-world government. The most prominent sign of the end times, however, is the nation of Israel itself. In 1948, Israel was recognized as a sovereign state, essentially for the first time since 605 BC, when the Babylonians took control of Judah. God promised Abraham that his posterity would have Canaan as an everlasting possession, and Ezekiel prophesied a physical and spiritual resuscitation of Israel. Having Israel as a nation in its own land is important in light of the end times prophecy because of Israel's prominence in eschatology. Iran's attacks bring long shadow war with Israel into the open. The volley of drones and missiles was the first time that Tehran directly attacked Israel from its own territory, one expert said. For decades, Israel and Iran have fought a shadow war across the Middle East, trading attacks by land, sea, air, and in cyberspace. The barrage of drones and missiles Iran launched at Israel, though nearly all were shot down or intercepted, represented a watershed in the conflict. It was the first time that Iran directly attacked Israel from its own territory, according to Aharon Bregman, a political scientist and expert in Middle East security issues at King's College in London, who called it a historic event. Iran has largely used foreign proxies, such as Lebanon's Hezbollah militia, to strike Israeli interests while targeted assassinations of Iranian military leaders and nuclear scientists have been a key part of Israel's strategy. For the first time in history, Iran launched a massive, 
direct attack on Israel. Over 300 Iranian cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and drones were launched at Israel overnight. It took hours for the projectiles to make the long journey over, so the whole nation had the heads up to get our bomb shelters ready and bunker down with everything we might need. We were told the drones would take eight hours to make their way to Israel, but cruise missiles can reach us much faster in two hours. But the far more dangerous ballistic missiles can arrive in just 12 minutes. IDF spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari made this statement about the unprecedented attack. Last night, Iran initiated an attack against Israel, launching over 300 threats of various types. The Iranian threat met the aerial and technological superiority of the IDF, along with a strong fighting coalition, which together intercepted the overwhelming majority of the threats. 99% of the threats launched towards Israeli territory were intercepted, a very significant strategic achievement. We praise God, keeper of Israel who neither slumbers nor sleeps, that not one Israeli was killed. When we consider how serious the threat was, it's extraordinary to see how the IDF dealt with the situation. We are very grateful for our armed forces and also all the countries who helped us. Some of our natural allies, such as the US and the UK, came to Israel's aid, but to the surprise of many, both Jordan and Saudi Arabia also helped to take down a large number of missiles as they were on their way to Israel. Airspace was even made available over Iraq to help the defensive measures. The ballistic missiles carried enough explosives to destroy an entire city block, uh, but were detonated mid-air with powerful explosions that boomed into the night. Jordan took many of these missiles down before they even entered Israel. We shudder to think what might have happened if they had actually landed at their intended destination. As well as gratitude to the IDF, our allies, and our neighbors, we are also extremely grateful to all those around the world who have been interceding for Israel at this time. They know that at the end of the day, it is the God of Israel who has kept us. Someone in a Jerusalem social media group summed up how many of us felt the day after the attack. Someone else joked that we've just witnessed the first direct flights from Iran to Israel since 1979. Another put out the theory that the drones were filled with breadcrumbs during the time of cleaning out all yeast in preparation for Passover, an Israeli nightmare. Israelis often use dark humor to cope with the extreme tension of hovering between life and death. And the fact that absolutely no one was killed makes the light relief a little lighter. A seven-year-old Bedouin girl from near the Israeli city of Arad was wounded by some falling shrapnel after an interception, but she was the only casualty in the entire country. It's been a night of miracles. All the help and cooperation from neighboring countries goes to show that despite much of the talk in the Arab world, there's actually a lot of appreciation for Israel being at the front line. Israel is fighting against the threat from Iran and Iranian proxies like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis on behalf of everyone. When push comes to shove, most of the Middle East would rather that Israel was still standing than the whole region implode into the kind of chaos driven by rebel violence as happened in Syria. As they stumble down to the bomb shelters in pajamas, the contrast between Israel and Gaza is stark. By and large, Israelis are well looked after by their government in times of crisis, with well-coordinated emergency measures, clear instructions on apps, and good information about how to stay safe. The population took cover underground while the battle raged above us in the skies. Sophisticated defense strategies like the Iron Dome disarm the bombs before they come anywhere near the ground. Meanwhile, Gazans have had no such care or provision. The many billions sent in aid to help people in Gaza went to line the pockets of their leaders or towards more rockets and tunnels. There is surely enough room for most of Gaza to shelter in the tunnels, but instead the terrorists monopolize the safest places. The best instructions on how Gazans can stay safe 
ironically come from the IDF, the enemy army, via leaflets and phone calls about where attacks will come and where to go instead. Similarly, the Iranians can't count on their government to put the interests of their people first, but a crazed religious ideology has been driving them on a path of destruction. But even with all of our amazing technology and defense systems, Israelis need to put their hope in God, and it might just be happening. One of the most popular searches on Google in Israel in the hours after the attack was Tehillim, the Hebrew word for Psalms. They are by no means out of the woods yet. Israel is already planning retaliation, and this will, of course, have its response from Iran. It's hard to see how escalation could be avoided. God's Word tells us that violence and darkness will increase towards the end, but it's important to keep praying for peace and pursuing it. That's what sons and daughters of God do. We need to stay vigilant in prayer and rest in God's protection without capitulating to fear. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 2 Kings 6.15.16 16. Are Israelis just going through a bad patch and our fortunes will brighten again soon? Or are we beginning to see Bible prophecies unfold in which the entire world turns against Israel and Jewish people in the last days? What does the Bible prophet Ezekiel tell us? This is as bad as I've seen Israel's global reputation suffer in my lifetime. There have certainly been other tough times. The IDF's response to the eruption of the first Palestinian Intifada in December 1987 comes to mind, as does Israel's response to the eruption of the second Intifada in September 2000. In my estimation, this is worse. But is it prophetic? Throughout the Bible, there are repeated prophetic warnings that when we get to the eschatological season known as the last days, the entire world will turn against the nation of Israel. For example, in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, it becomes painfully clear that no nation comes to Israel's defense when the war of Gog and Magog begins in the last days. Many pastors and Bible scholars believe that Ezekiel is describing a Russian dictator who will lead the attack on Israel in an alliance with the military forces of Iran, Turkey, Sudan, and several other Central Asian and African nations. Yet the prophecy makes it clear that when such an invasion comes, Israel will be all alone, utterly abandoned, even by its closest friends and allies. In the writings of the ancient Hebrew prophet Zechariah, we find another Old Testament example of all nations turning against Israel in the end times, Consider this passage from Zechariah 12, 2, 3. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about on that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. The eyes and enmity of all the nations of the earth will be against Jerusalem, Israel's eternal capital, the prophet tells us. Why? Because God is going to supernaturally make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling or intoxication to all the peoples around in order that all of Israel's enemies would be severely injured. That is, in the last days, the Bible indicates that all of the leaders of the world will essentially get drunk on the notion that Israel, Jerusalem, is the problem that the world must solve. Yet, God also makes it clear that all the nations that turn against Israel will themselves face divine judgment and be severely injured. We also find such sobering prophecies in the New Testament. The Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, repeatedly prophesied that all nations would turn against Israel at the end of days. 
One example is found in Revelation chapter 12, where the apostle writes that one day, Satan will be thrown down to earth where he deceives the whole world to turn against Israel and the Jewish people and to persecute them terribly. The prophecy goes on to tell us that Satan even forces the Jewish people to flee from the land of Israel into the wilderness, widely believed by many Bible scholars to be the Petra region of the current kingdom of Jordan, but that God will protect them there for 1,260 days. Another example is found in Revelation 16. There the apostle writes that demonic forces in the spirit world will gather together the kings of the whole world for a terrible and apocalyptic war against Israel during the last days. In that war, it is written, all the military forces of the world will converge in the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddo, located in the Jezreel Valley in northern Israel, and which in English is called famously Armageddon. The text is clear that God will supernaturally destroy and judge all of these enemies of Israel. But before he does so, God will sovereignly allow the world to turn against Israel en masse. Are we there yet? Have we arrived at the prophetic point in history in which the entire world is turning against Israel and the Jewish people? No, not yet. But that's definitely where we are trending. The next prophetic war is not Armageddon. That takes place during what the Old Testament calls Daniel's seventh week, or what the New Testament calls the Tribulation, or the Great Tribulation. The next prophetic war is the War of Gog and Magog, as described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Psalm 83, and the coming battle for Israel. Surely the Sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing His plan to His servants, the prophets. End time experts speak a lot about the Gog Magog War of Ezekiel 38 through 39, a prophecy that predicts a powerful confederacy, apparently led by Russia, that is destined to someday invade Israel. Some think that its fulfillment is even knocking at our door. But a lesser known prophecy is gaining momentum and importance for our day. Psalm 83 in which a different confederacy attempts to wipe out Israel. This psalm seems to be addressing current issues in the Middle East, nations conspiring to destroy Israel. The prophet appeals for victory. In Psalm 83, the prophet Asaph appeals to God, asking him to make the coalition members perish in disgrace. Psalm 83, 9 to 18. In fact, Obadiah, Ezekiel 25. 27, 37, 10, and Jeremiah 49, 1, 6 prophesy that these coalition members will indeed perish and be cursed as Genesis 12, 3 predicts, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. These connecting prophetic verses seem to refer to Israel's victory in Psalm 83. A resulting sense of regional security may make Israel ripe for the Battle of Ezekiel 38, the invasion of a nine-member coalition whose leaders say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates to seize, spoil, and carry off plunder. Ezekiel 38, 11, 12. While Israel today is indeed prospering and is a safe country to visit, she will have incredible riches and live in unparalleled safety after the victory of Psalm 83 is complete. Psalm 83, a pending prophecy. Some theologians have argued that the battle highlighted in Psalm 83, 5-8, was fulfilled in Israel's 1948 War for Independence. However, the tents of Edom only came into existence in 1949 after the war ended. And since Psalm 83 lists them first, Salus believes the tents of Edom will play a key role in this coming war. Other theologians have made the argument that the 1967 Six-Day War fulfilled this prophecy. Still, only a portion of the ten members listed were involved in that war, 
So the Six-Day War does not seem to be the fulfillment of this end-time prophecy. Since neither of these wars precisely fulfill the prophecy, we can understand that some future war involving a 10-member coalition will fulfill it. Today, that coalition, which is united under the common values and motives of Islam, fit the prophecy's requirements like no other time in history. Therefore, many believe the war in Psalm 83 will happen soon before the invasion of Ezekiel 38. In fact, none of the 10 coalition members of Psalm 83 are mentioned in Ezekiel 38, though the book of Ezekiel mentions them elsewhere. Pitfalls in Interpreting Prophecy I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Isaiah 62, 6, 7. There is a saying that hindsight is 20 twentieths. Likewise, Bible prophecy is more easily understood in hindsight after its fulfillment. Still, Psalm 83 reminds us that we must keep a watchful eye on the Middle East and pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as well as diligently study God's Word. As we watch, pray, and study, God will give us wisdom as events unfold and the pieces of the prophetic puzzle come into place. And when they do, that picture will be illuminated on the same wall where God has displayed His plan for Israel and mankind and where the Messianic prophecies are permanently hung. What are Gog and Magog? Historically speaking, Magog was a grandson of Noah. The descendants of Magog settled to the far north of Israel, likely in Europe and northern Asia. Magog seems to be used to refer to northern barbarians in general, but likely also has a connection to Magog the person. The people of Magog are described as skilled warriors. Gog and Magog appear in Ezekiel 38, 39, and in Revelation 20, 7, 8. While these two passages use the same names, a close study of Scripture clearly demonstrates they do not refer to the same people and events. The events are separated by at least 1,000 years. In Ezekiel's prophecy, Gog will be the leader of a great army that attacks the land of Israel, which is peaceful and unsuspecting at the time. Gog is described as the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. When will Ezekiel's battle of Gog and Magog occur? There are a couple of theories. Before the tribulation begins, this view points to the fact that, after the battle, the people of Israel will be burning the enemy's weapons for seven years and spend over seven months burying the dead. That length of time most likely requires the battle to be fought before the tribulation and possibly even before the rapture of the church. During the first part of the seven-year tribulation, this view hinges on the fact that Israel is at peace when the attack begins. The security Israel enjoys is assumed to be the result of Israel's covenant with the Antichrist at the beginning of the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. According to Ezekiel, Magog will not win. God will intervene to preserve Israel. There shall be a great earthquake. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and God will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on Gog and on his troops and on the many nations with him. The result is that the nations will see God's greatness and holiness. Gog and Magog are mentioned again in Revelation 27, 8. The duplicated use of the names Gog and Magog in Revelation 28, 9, is to show that these people demonstrate the same rebellion against God and antagonism toward God as those in Ezekiel 38, 39. It is similar to someone today calling a person the devil because he or she is sinful and evil. We know that person is not really Satan, but because that person shares similar characteristics, he or she might be referred to as the devil. The book of Revelation uses Ezekiel's prophecy about Magog to portray a final end times attack on the nation of Israel. The result of this battle is that all are destroyed and Satan will find his final place in the lake of fire. 
It is important to recognize that the Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38, 39 is quite different from the one in Revelation 27, 8. In the Battle of Ezekiel 38, 39, the armies came primarily from the north and involved only a few nations of the earth. The battle in Revelation 27, 9 will involve all nations, so armies will come from all directions, not just from the north. There is no mention of Satan in the context of Ezekiel 38, 39. In Revelation 20, 7, the context clearly places the battle at the end of the millennium with Satan as the primary character. Ezekiel 39, 11, 12 states that the dead will be buried for seven months. There would be no need to bury the dead if the battle in Ezekiel 38, 39 is the one described in Revelation 20, 8, 9, for immediately following Revelation 20. 8, 9 is the great white throne judgment, and then the present heaven and earth are destroyed, replaced by a new heaven and earth. There obviously will be a need to bury the dead if the battle takes place before or in the early part of the tribulation, for the land of Israel will be occupied for another 1,000 years, the length of the Millennial Kingdom. Will those prophecies come to pass soon, much less in our lifetime? No one knows but God Himself, but they could. So we should be watching closely. After all, it certainly appears that the chess pieces are being arranged on the board for just such a war. The dictator of Russia is building alliances with the leaders of Iran, Turkey, and Sudan, to name just a few. The nations of the world are increasingly turning against Israel and the Jewish people. Even the leaders of Israel's most trustworthy ally, the United States of America, are abandoning Israel. What will the church do? Our test has come. In light of all that is happening spiritually and geopolitically in the world today, my question is this, what will the church do? Will true followers of Jesus Christ and their pastors and shepherds who read and love and teach the Bible stand with Israel in our darkest hour or abandon Israel? Will they embrace and unconditionally love and protect the Jewish people as anti-Semitism surges and more and more Jew hatred is unleashed? Or will the church flunk this test of history? While there were many true Christian heroes during the Holocaust who protected the Jewish people at great risk to their own lives and freedom, much of the Roman Catholic Church and Lutheran churches failed disastrously. So when you stand before the God of Israel one day soon, what will he say to you? When our great test is over, will you have passed or failed? What role does Iran play in the end times? There are several biblical prophecies of the end times that mention Iran, called Persia or Elam in the Bible. Given the fact that Iran is often in the news as a nation seeking armaments and repeatedly issuing threats against Israel, students of Bible prophecy are taking note. Iran does have a role to play in the end times, but first, a little history of Iran and its neighborhood as it relates to biblical history. Jeremiah prophesied that Elam, a nation east of Babylon, west of Persia, and south of Media, would be conquered and then rise to power again. True to that prophecy, Babylon conquered Elam in 596 BC. But then Persia under Cyrus the Great took control of that area and the Elamites and Medes became part of the Persian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire ascended to power and conquered Babylon in 539 BC fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 21, 2. This happened during the time of Daniel. In fact, Daniel later resided in the province of Elam in Persia. Persia is the setting for the book of Esther and the first part of Nehemiah. Alexander the Great's conquests put an end to Persia as a world power, fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel 8. In the following centuries, Persia was ruled by the Seleucids, the Parthians, the Sasanians, the Romans, the Byzantines, and finally, in A.D. 636, the Muslims. In 1501, 
the state of Iran was founded. In the New Testament, men from Iran are mentioned indirectly as Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, who were present in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. All three of these people groups were Jews who lived in the area of ancient Persia, modern-day Iran, and they were present in Jerusalem to witness the birth of the church. Iran's involvement in the end times will be as one of the nations involved in the Battle of Gog and Magog, which probably occurred during the first half of the Tribulation. Ezekiel 38, 5 specifically mentions Persia as an ally of Magog. Other nations included in this coalition will be Sudan, Turkey, Libya, and others. This vast army will come against Israel, who at that time will be a peaceful and unsuspecting people. The outcome of this end times invasion is predicted. God supernaturally intervenes and Gog's coalition is utterly destroyed. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops and the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. Iran, allied with Russia, will think their invasion of Israel is a sure victory. But God has different plans. In protecting Jerusalem, God will send a strong message to the world. I will make known my holy name among my people Israel. I will no longer let my holy name be profaned, and the nations will know that I, the Lord, am the Holy One in Israel. And lastly, I want you to spend a few seconds praying for Israel. Please pray for Israel's safety and protection as the retaliations being planned. Pray for the seven-year-old Bedouin girl who is having an operation for her head wound. Pray for peace-loving Iranians and for the nation of Iran. Pray that God opens the eyes of the nations to see the truth of what is happening here in the Middle East. Pray that many are saved and come to faith in these extreme circumstances, both in Israel and around the world. Well, that's all about today's video. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye.